All right, so thanks every, everyone on, online for joining us uh, today. And uh, everyone here again, welcome and thank you for joining us. So today's going to be a little different, um, mainly because when, when Mario, I'm going to go back to this whole Mario thing because it affected more than just one or two people. So when Mario decided that he wasn't going to come, now I know some of the inside reasons, okay, and they're, they're, they're kind of irrelevant at this point. I understand why he would have canceled anyone in their right mind would have, okay, obviously following God, and God wouldn't have so his, his, his individuals come because to an area that don't want them. That's usually how it works, okay. So with, with this, I, I know that, and it's like Tom said, a lot, there's a lot of people that were discouraged. I was discouraged. I was already getting beat up by the pastors in this area because there's so few of them that really want revival. And those that want revival, there's even fewer that really want reformation. So, because if we understand what reformation means, reformation means that your church is never going to be the way it was. So if your church is sitting around and, you know, just, you know, you're a bunch of pew warmers, don't take this wrong, don't get offended, but if you're a bunch of pew warmers, right, and your church, is, church changes, some of your people are going to leave. Yep. Because not all, every Christian decides that they want to get up and do something. Though we're called to, right? Everybody remember the last chapter of Mark? It says, matter of fact, I think it's almost the last verse of Mark. It says, go, go. That means you got to get up out of your seats, go and preach the gospel. So the reformation part of this tends to be the part that the pastors don't want because it's going to change their church. They may lose their church in reformation because everything's changing. A lot of them don't like the mess. Revival's messy. It's just the way it is. Revival's messy. You're going to get, if, if it, we're doing this right, we're getting people off the street that never knew Jesus until, until maybe five minutes before they came in the church. They don't know the decorum of church because, as a matter of fact, I think a lot of the decorum of church needs to be thrown out anyways. It only stifles Holy Spirit. But we still need order, right? Okay, so in revival, it's messy. It's not chaotic. I've heard some individuals say, well, it's all chaos. If it's chaos, it's Satan. It's very clear chaos is from Satan. God's a God of order. It may be messy. We may end up having people, you know, standing in the aisle and kids running around and, and all kinds of messy stuff. But that's revival. Are we ready for that? Are we ready for that as a church? Are you ready in your heart for that? Are you ready for the individual that just walked off the street, who's been living in the street for the last six years, sitting next to you? That, I think, is the biggest problem that most pastors have with Reformation. They don't want to face the reality of where we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be doing. So this really started me into a huge issue. I get discouraged with Mario Murillo not showing up. I get over that and I get beat up at a pastor's meeting because I believe in preaching the truth. Evil's evil, I'm sorry if your, your ideological political affiliation Lines up with evil. I don't care. Evil's evil, and I'm going to call it out. So I get beat up there. Now I'm really discouraged. <laughs> you can ask Pastor Kathy. I was, go I was going through. All right? Hence why it's so important to be praying for your pastor. That, yeah, that's, that's why you pray for, for your pastor. So, and then I heard that um, Pastor Paul kind of went through the same thing. Me and him talked 
the, the, the next Friday, and we talked for quite, quite some time on the phone, and, and he said, you know what, we're still doing it. We're still doing it. I told him, Pastor, I'll be there every day I can. I would have loved to have just move, moved up there for the, the week and just stayed in a hotel and volunteered as much as I could. Only to come, come to find out, when we did get there Sunday night, I walked up to Pastor Toby, and I asked him, I said, so, uh, where do you need us to work? And he said something that was absolutely amazingly great. He said, we had to find places for the volunteers that already volunteered. We don't need no more. We have too many. That's a nice problem, right? Praise God. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, I think... Uh, I think they said they had like three or four hundred Sunday night. And I guess Wednesday night was the most. I, did, I have not talked to Pastor Paul since, so I don't know really how many they had. But it was very encouraging to hear that Pastor Paul went through the same thing I was going through and everyone else that was all ready for Mario to come. And he did it anyways. Part of courage... We talk about courage all the time. Christians are supposed to have courage, right? Right? Do you know the, 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 real, the real definition of courage that I learned in the military is feel, feel the fear and do it anyways. You don't let the fear paralyze you. You just do it. So that's what this church has been doing. We've been pushing forth for all of this great revival and going through some stuff. As a church. But when I went Sunday night, I was filled, or Sunday evening rather, whatever time, yeah, 6.30 evening, night, whatever. So I was filled with so, so much anticipation and expectation that God would show up. And that he would do things that I've never seen done. And all of you know, we've had, we, in this church, we, we've had individuals cured of cancer. We've had individuals raise up off de deathbeds a couple times. We've seen the minor colds get healed, and all kinds of different things happen in this house. Okay? I'm sorry? I just said the lungs, the knees. The lungs, the knees, the eyes. Okay? I mean, it just, this is, this is what this house does. Somebody is, is ill, or we are gonna, we're going to fix you with God. Okay, that's just the way it is. I'll, you know. So in my expectation, I wanted to see new, something new. Now, I've heard of all kinds of things happening. You know, I, uh, one individual that I, I followed for several years until he, he passed away and went, went to heaven was Kubis Ren, Ren, Van Rensburg. Well, they, in, either in South Africa, his church was in South Africa, and they had a wall. And I love seeing pictures of the wall, the back wall. It's a whole wall, and it's a big, huge cathedral. I don't know how many feet high. It's definitely higher than ours. But the whole back wall was lined with crutches and wheelchairs and walkers and, I mean, the whole thing. But in the heyday, I say heyday, like it was, like, it's still happening, I guess. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't heard much from, from uh, the, his ministry since his passing, but they used to have dumpsters out back that they had to, had to have emptied every week because of all the crutches and wheelchairs and everything that they'd throw in the, that dumpster. Glory be to God. Praise God, right? Yeah. So here's my expectation going to Batavia. Without the great evangelist, right? Not about the man. So what do we see? What do we see? I was expecting so much. Endurance service, God did not disappoint. See, if we go expecting, God will never disappoint. God will never disappoint you. But we have to have in our head and in our mind that, we're, that we already have Holy Spirit in us, but Holy Spirit's going to come upon us. And Holy Spirit's going to fall in that service. And the next thing you know, that whole service is dictated by Holy Spirit. And then, 
at the end of the service, I seen something that till, still today, I can't exactly describe. The very first thing I, I seen spiritually was God and the presence of Holy Spirit in that room. But as I'm watching, now you can ask Pastor Kathy later, I'm a very obser observant individual. I pay attention to people and I pay attention to what's going on. And I'm just sitting there and all these people coming up for prayer. And, that, and the, I mean, just people just coming up for prayer. And I'm watching, I'm sitting there and I'm watching this lady in a motorized wheelchair come up. And they're praying for her and praying for her and praying for her and praying for her. I'm just observing her and I'm observing another individual over here to my right. And they're just praying and praying for her. And next thing I know, she's standing and, and I'm watching her. But I'm watching this individual too. The reason I'm watching this individual very intently is he's in a wheelchair also. Earlier in the service, he gave his life to the Lord. So I'm really watching him. And I don't know why God had me watching him. But what I seen, after he seen this lady getting up out of the wheelchair and walking up and down the stairs. Okay, so this, so this is at the end of service. The, the service was really done at this point. People were leaving. But God had me stay. I wanted to leave. I'm tired. Okay? Two, we have a two-hour drive home, we had a two-hour drive there. We had service in the morning, and usually I don't sleep very well Saturday nights. I, God just has me up too much. So I'm tired. I'm like, I want to go home. But Holy Spirit had me sit there, and I'm just watching, and I'm observing. And he's, just wa he's watching this whole thing unfold intently. And then he leaves. He's, they're, they're, they're getting ready to leave. And they're, they're you know, he's will. Yeah, um, I don't know if his wife or somebody was pushing him back to the back of the church. So I go up and I'm talking to Pastor Toby. And me and Pastor Toby were talking and another gentleman that I just, just was introduced to. And I happened to look over to my left. Because now I'm at the far end of the... And over to my left is this gentleman in the wheelchair again. And he's intently watching the lady from the motorized wheelchair walk up and down the steps going to the, to the worship area where the band is. And there's like six steps. It's not, it, 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 whatever it is, six, seven, it could have been a hundred, she would have done it. The point is it wasn't one. And she's just going up and down this, I mean, she's going up and down it by herself. No help. And he's watching her intently. Now, I would say he was probably at least from, from here to the back wall way. And he's watching intently. And all of a sudden, I look over, and I see him, and he said, his hands are on the, ed the handles of the wheelchair, and he just pushes himself up and says, she can do it, I can do it. And literally walks over to Pastor Toby, which is this distance, without the wheelchair, and asks for more prayer. Expectation. Expectation. He expected something from God. He expected it. He may even not have said what we would say, I would have said, well, you know what? God did it for her. He'll do it for me. He said it in his vernacular, but it was 100% truth. She can do it. I can do it. God, you did it for her. You can do it for me, and you will. Amen. Amen. You see, the, see, when we look at everything, we actually do expect things then it'll happen. There's no, we, when Holy Spirit, when we expect Holy Spirit to be 
in our presence, right? We should expect it. Who, sh who should not expect that every day? We should expect it every day, everywhere we're going. The Holy Spirit is with us. I went, I went desiring, desiring a new filling, a new excitement. When you're down and you're being discouraged, when you're discouraged, when, when things seem like they're not going the right way, because I, I know you guys don't have this problem, because, but I do sometimes. Things just don't go my way. Okay? I'm talking to these pastors. That, you know, these pastors of these bigger churches that you would think that would want revival and reformation, that would want to find, get the lost and not just say, well, we have an outreach, but you want to actually really get the lost and the wounded and the hurting, bring them into a, a good relationship with Christ, but they don't. That's discouraging as a pastor. And then have Mario not, not show up. Though we know it isn't Mario, but I knew what he, he brought last time and he br would bring the same thing. We know that. But here we are. We get discouraged. I was going there to find my encouragement again. Is that wrong for a pastor to say? No, not at all. Not at all. I'm just trying to be honest. Because even when you are in the midst of the greatest of things going on, if you don't give praise to God and give God all the glory, nothing happens. You just are the same person you were two minutes ago. I didn't want to leave there the same person Sunday night. I didn't want to leave there the same person I was Sunday night on Tuesday night. Because I wanted a more, more encounter with God. And that's not that I don't encounter God every day. I just want more. When you want more and more and more, nothing can separate you. We sing that one song from uh, Jeremy Riddle, where you are. He says, I can't ever be anywhere else because I've seen your face. I wanted to see God's face, and I did. I was already on fire for God. Watch out, world. Jesus said, in Matthew, that we are supposed to do more and greater works than he did. The only way we're going to do more and greater works than Jesus did is to have constant encounters with God. Constant encounters with God. So that he changes everything in us and everything around us and all the atmosphere that we ever walk into. That's what we need. If we're running into a problem, who, who doesn't have a problem in life? Thank you, I'm with the right crowd. So if you have a problem in life and you don't bring God into it, you're going to always have that problem. God's the only one that can solve the problem. We can't do it. I want to be able to do greater things. I want... I want to see even more wheelchairs thrown away. I want to see more people set free. The only way we can have this happen is if we're on fire for God. And the only way we can be on fire for God is to have a constant encounter with Holy Spirit and God. Let's take, take and I'm going to go a little bit different here. Let's open our books, our Bibles to Ezekiel 3. I'm going to change a little bit because in me, Pastor Paul read some of these scriptures here in Ezekiel. And it hit me so hard that I realized that there's, there's whole, whole churches that are completely lost because the pastors don't read this. And they don't want to do this. Everybody there, Ezekiel 3.11 is where we're going to start. Then we, well, we're going to read 3.11 and then we're going to go to some more. So Ezekiel 3.11 says this, And go, get the captives, to the captives to the children of your people, and speak to them and tell them, Thus says the Lord God, whether you hear or whether you refuse. Let's just stop right there. One of, when you have a pastor's heart, you don't like it when people don't hear you. 
Because your heart is for the people, to help the people, to get the people to the point of where they need to be in God. Somewhere I read that we're supposed to make disciples. Well, to make disciples, somebody has to speak into your life. So as a pastor, it hurts when people don't take good, solid, biblical advice. But this has to remind us that for those that hear, you go forth with. For those who refuse to hear, you don't. And that's God saying that. So let's jump down to verse 18. Because here's, the, here's really the, the nuts and bolts of this. And this is why I, I preach what I preach and, and everything else. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his, from his wicked ways to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will be on you. So when you guys get mad at me that I'm pointing out sin, which I don't really point out directly, but in, in the sermon, the Holy Spirit's pointing out sin and things that you're not doing with Holy Spirit or the biblical way, don't get mad at me. It's a requirement of me. Because I don't want you to die in your iniquities and your sin and your, your issues that you have. I would be a lousy person, personally. But biblically... It says that I'm a bad, I'm really bad. Let's see, if the blood's on my hands, what am I? Basically a murderer. Think about that for a little while. All right, let's keep going. Yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, you shall die, he shall die in his iniquity. So either way, you can, die, you can die in your iniquity. Either you listen or you don't listen. <coughs> Excuse me. The difference is if I deliver my own soul. So if I don't tell you that you're walking in your wickedness, I'm in trouble. I would think that every pastor would read these verses and shake and tremble in fear. And I mean real tremble in fear if they're not doing it. Again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because you did not give him warning. He shall die in his sin, and, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will, be, will I require at your hand. See? Same thing, over and over. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteousness should, righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took warning. Also, you will have delivered your own soul. Sin, sin captivates Christians. We go into captivity because of our sin. And that's what happens. When we're in captivity, we cannot be effective Christian soldiers. There's no way. Because that sin is always going to infiltrate into your thinking. Sin will always take you further than you want to go and keep you there longer than you want to be. It just is going to happen. We know that the fox is, right? the, the fox is what spoils the, the vine. We can get destroyed by those little foxes. Pastors that have compromised, either they, they're, they're for some of these compromising issues like Black, Black Lives Matter. I thought Jesus died for every life. Amen. Shouldn't, Amen. We, shouldn't we be compromising and just say, God died for everybody? Yeah. Instead of Black Lives Matter? Everybody's life matters. Pastors that preach that and side with that, they've compromised. They're capitulated to one, one demographic and left the others. 
These, these are the places that the people should be leaving. Obviously, the pastor is not too worried about, about where they walk as a Christian. Right? I mean, if they compromise over here, they're going to compromise here. When you compromise over here, you will compromise over here. And every time you compromise, you get closer and closer to religion and further and further away from God. Compromising is bad. All right. Now, let's go to uh, Psalm 51, if you would, please. We talked about this last, last week, but I think this is a pretty fitting with what we're talking about. Uh, we're going to go to verse 10, I'm sorry, 51.10. Everyone there? It says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Now, last week, we really went into this really quite a bit and what it, this meant. But I believe why we don't see the salvations and the miracles like we do, many Christians aren't there. They're not willing to pay this price. See, when you gave your, your life to the Lord, you paid a price. You have a price to pay. It's not free. It's just not free. We were bought with a precious price. And now we have to pay it back. Not literally, but that's just wording. No, no hate mail on, on YouTube. I know, the, I know scripture. But we still have to pay it back. How do we pay it back? Create in me, O oh Lord, a clean heart. That means you're going to do things <laughs> contrary to the way you used to do them. You're going to be sitting there saying, wait a minute, this TV program that I've been watching for 30 years, it sucks. Oh, okay, okay but let me back up. 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Biblically, it's wrong. I shouldn't be watching it. The stuff I'm letting my kids see, I, well, shut it down. This is the price you pay. I'm not trying to get legalistic. No legalistic. I mean, we're, we're, we live in the spirit, not in the law. Okay? But Holy Spirit tells us to keep watch what goes in our eyes and in our ears. Right? Doesn't Jesus say that I, the eye is the light of the... Right? So whatever's going in your eyes is going to affect your heart. It doesn't matter what it is. So we need to watch this stuff. We have to be careful of it. We, to see these salvations and these miracles, to walk in the presence of God the way that we're supposed to walk, and to host Holy Spirit. Bill Johnson says it this way, Holy Spirit is in us for us. Holy Spirit is upon us for everyone we talk to, for everyone around us. See, we're not really taught too much in the New Testament about Holy Spirit upon us. Because really, that, that's an Old Testament thing. Because Jesus didn't die, Holy Spirit couldn't indwell in us. Or in them, I should say. Yeah, we weren't there. Yeah, we weren't there. Well, I don't know, some of you might. But. <laughs> <laughs> so, but today, we have Holy Spirit dwelling in us, which is awesome. But if we never let Holy Spirit out of us, we can't ever help anyone. Here's a, here's a daring prayer. Just pray that everybody that sees you sees Holy Spirit, not you. Amen. It'll start changing who you are. I wonder sometimes with this, the, these verses, why this doesn't happen. I wonder if it's because the leaders aren't really concerned about what we just talked about in Ezekiel. I wonder if that's it. 
I wonder if we have leaders out there not, not broaching subjects that, that will cause their congregation to squirm in their seat. Okay? Or maybe, they're, maybe they're, they're not going into the areas that will make their congregation decide, well, I don't like this and I need an itchy ear, so I'm going to leave. I need my ears itched, you know, something like, something like a dog, you know, Romeo loves his ears itched, you know. There's Christians that like that. Maybe that's what's going to happen, and they don't do that because they know. And then they're going to be, oh, no, we can't pay our bills because our congregation went down. Well, first off, you already have a problem because your congregation is not your source of money. God is. It never is. If it's the source of your paycheck, which I have actually heard pastors say that, then you're in, in the wrong business. Go start a business and leave the, leave the Christians to become Christians. All right. So, you're still in Psalms, right? Let's look at verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted. Let's put that all together. Okay, so create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Right? Don't take your spirit from me. So I need a clean heart. Right? And then don't take your spirit from me. Now we know Holy Spirit's never going to leave you as a born-again Christian, right? He's always going to be in you. So where, what is the implication of this? That something more can be upon us that God can take away from us. Let's see. We're reading in the Old Testament, right? This is King David. King David had the Holy Spirit upon him, right? So if Holy Spirit's upon us, can he leave us? Yes. Yes. Jesus, when he was baptized, Holy Spirit came upon him, right? It says, as a dove. I like how Bill Johnson describes it. He said, if you knew you had Holy Spirit, who's a dove, just put, everybody picture a dove on my shoulder. Every move you made would have been calculated. You'd never do anything rash and quick. Doves are very skittish. They'll leave really fast. So you'd be doing everything, planning the Holy Spirit is on your shoulder so that when you go into Walmart and you walk up to a cashier, she falls down on the power of the Holy Spirit and nobody knows why, but she, she has just had an experience with God. Because the Holy Spirit is upon you. You'd pay attention to every step you made, every word you said, every thought you thought, everything you looked in your heart. Everything would be Holy Spirit's right there. I'm going to make sure Holy Spirit stays on me because I'm called to set the captives free. You're called to set the captives free. Jesus quoted that Psalm, I think it's 60. It might be 61. I get him confused, but it's either 60 or 61. When he was in the synagogue, he was actually declaring it over every Christian's life. Because he knew Holy Spirit was coming in us. All right. Let's take a look in John. I'm going to go to John 14. 12 first, please. I know this is kind of quiet. Y'all are y'all are really quiet. Yes. 14:12. John 14:12. Everybody there? And we, I mentioned this, but I think we, I, God, God's just kind of sit, setting it on my heart that we need to actually read it. Everybody there? It says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. All right, right there. 
right there tells all of us Christians what Jesus did, everything recorded in the Bible that Jesus did, what should we be doing? Exactly the same. So there has to be something that we have, somewhere that we have to go with this. There has to be more than just a, you know, church service as normal. All right. Then he says, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. So we're to do the same works as Jesus. That means raise the dead, cleanse the leopard, right? Get people, all, get, get people to stand up out of wheelchairs and get rid of canes, right? Am I, am I reading this wrong? No. But yet, what do we do? So there has to be something missing in what Christians are being taught on a general sense to the whole congregation, something's missing. And I believe that's the presence of God because we don't decide to have that clean heart, which is a price to pay. To have a clean heart is a price to pay. The question is, are you willing to pay that price to have the precious presence of God in you? and around you consistently. Are you willing to pay, pay that price? I think that's where, where most people miss it. Either they don't know it or they're giving some concept of it, but they don't realize that that price is to get rid of sin. Every bit of sin. Paul says we, when we sin, we choose to sin. I don't know about you, though, but that makes, makes me feel bad. That when I do sin, I choose to do that for some reason or another. That means there's somewhere in my, in my soulish realm that I haven't really, really had God take over. There's a stronghold in my mind, maybe, that I haven't really said, all right, God, you can just have that too. This price to pay means intimacy with God. It means setting aside the time from family and friends and this and that and the other thing and saying, no, 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 this is my time with the Lord. I'm going to do it. It could be just driving, driving to work. I can't tell you how many great things I get from the Lord just driving to church. If you're really listening to the Lord, you'll hear these things. He'll be constantly telling you what to do, what not to do, how to get rid of this issue and that issue, changing your life and transforming your mind into who God needs you to be. Because each and every one of us has a, a sphere of influence that we're supposed to be evangelizing. That's how it's supposed to be. If every Christian understood that they're supposed to evangelize every sphere of influence they have, the world would have been a complete different world by now. That's all the disciples did. The sphere of influence they, they discipled. That's it. They knew who, who Jesus was, and they know who Holy Spirit was. I wonder sometimes if one of the reasons we don't really have all these miracles happening is do we ha truly have individuals that really gave their lives to the Lord? Or are they just sitting there saying, I'm a Christian? And whose fault's that? The pastor's. The pastor's fault the leaders of the church from over time. See, when it comes right down to it, people like Mario, and we're going to have Sean, I never pronounced his last name right, Sean Fout, Fout or Fout's going to be here in August, or any man, or event, it's not revival. See, our problem, we, what we've decided in, in this this may have been what my issue was when I heard Mario was not going to come and I was a little discouraged on that. 
It may have been I had in me somewhere, well, this event is revival. And that could be everybody. That could have been it. I don't know. All I know, it's not there no more. Because an event or a man or a woman, they come in, they are not revival. When Pastor Erica comes and we go and we eva- go out and evangelize, that's not revival. We have to redefine what revival is. Revival is in us. We're the carriers of revival. We're supposed to carry that revival to everywhere where we go. That means Holy, we have to be so in tune with Holy Spirit. Somehow we have to get there. You guys know my, my, my biggest prayer is to actually see the manifest presence of Jesus. It says it in the Bible that he'll do that. So that's where, we, where I, want, I, I don't want the miracles. I don't care, and I've said this for years, I don't care if my back is ever healed. I don't care. I want Jesus. I want his manifest presence. That's where I'm at. I'll give up anything for Jesus. I just want him. And that's where this church is headed. I hope you join us. Because we're going to go on an adventure. We're going to get Jesus. And we're going to have a revival like a revival is supposed to be. It may be time that we redefine what the term revival is. Because most of the Christian world thinks revival is this great big event that goes on and on and on. You know, Brownsville, Toronto. What's the other one down there? Lakeland, I think it was. You know, uh, you know Azuzu Street. The Welch Revival. They all ended. Why did they end? But yet, I know a pastor that's been in revival for 20 years. Pastor Bill Johnson. 20 years their church has been in revival. Consistently. Now, you know why I'm part of his network. Because he ha- he's been doing it, and I want to. Central New York is near and dear to my heart, and if it doesn't change, I don't know what I'll do. But I will fight to change it. Because that's what we're called to do. See, most Christians don't realize that we're at war. We are at war. Paul said, put on your whole armor. Right? Put on your whole armor of God, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, gospel, belt of truth, right? Sword of faith. What most people don't realize is he was basing that on the Roman soldier. Roman soldier, just like when I was in the military, I had no rear guard. I had nothing protecting me behind me. Because when you're at war, you're only advancing. If you're standing still, you're dead. You advance, 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 advance. Too many Christians think that they can just sit there and never advance. And therefore they're being destroyed by the Satan. I don't know what this is. I guess I'm done. I got more, I just don't know how to put it into words. Does that make sense? That makes sense? All right. So, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for you. Oh, Lord, we just, we just want more of you, Lord. Show each and every one of us what we have to do to have your presence on us. You're already in us, we know, just on us, so we can start affecting the world around us, Lord. Teach us to walk as though, as Bill says, there's a dove on our shoulder, consciously understanding and consciously reminding us that you're there. Mm. Yes, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We love you.